In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6, the passage that we want to consider tonight as we continue our series of what a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of Christian ought to be, is that love rejoices not in iniquity, but love rejoices in truth. Now, I know that I was my paraphrase on that, but I want you to understand that. In that particular passage, just as in Ephesians 4.15, there is a combining of those two wonderful words, love and truth. And together they make a very powerful combination. Now when you consider the man who has a desire to proclaim the truth, and it comes from a very sincere and loving heart, that is something that is great indeed. Love rejoices not unto iniquity, but rather love rejoices in that which is true. Through the years, I've come to learn that one of the greatest compliments that can ever be spoken of to an individual is this. He loves the truth. He loves the truth. And implied in that statement is the individual that he is an honest person, the person who loves truth. Sometimes I would hear it said of another that this person really does love the preaching or the proclamation of truth. Those of us who have had that desire to preach the truth of God, we certainly appreciate all of those who will make that statement about any one of us loving the truth. But if one really loves the truth of the Bible, that means he's going to love all the truth that there is. I mean, he's interested in only that which is true, right? I've known some who have made the claim that they love to preach the truth, and then they will speak about others using whatever little bit of information they may receive in order to build a story about those same people. Those individuals really don't love truth. You know, if we say we love biblical truth, then we ought to love all truth. That is, I'm not interested in any hearsay and innuendos about another. I should be interested in truth. What is truth about another person? You see, love demands that. Love demands and rejoices in truth. If the Bible says it, then we love it. Because we accept the Bible as that biblical truth. Therefore, I'm also interested in that and what is the truth in all matters that pertain to life. And so the one who loves truth is an honest person. Listen to the writer of preview, uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 12, 19, when he says, The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. And, and probably all of us have heard this and are familiar with this passage in Romans uh, 12, 17. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. We might remember that. So we're talking tonight about a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of Christian, and we've been talking about that for some time, but this person who knows how to love, as is instructed by God, has a love for truth. A lover of truth is an honest person. He's an honest man, and he's a man who is in love with the truth that comes from God, right? A lover of truth. Therefore, if I love the truth of God... I had to have an intense hatred for that which is despised and hated by God. Now, I can know this, that all people are loved by God, and therefore we are to love all people as well. And we might not always like the actions of people. You know, we always say this, you know, well, you know, I, I love that sinner, but I don't love his sin. I don't love what he's engaged in, but I love the sinner because he has a soul. 
And I want them to be saved. But we cannot like the actions of all people, but we can love them. And we can know this about God. He loves people, though he may at the same time hate the various actions of people. In Psalm 119, a great tribute is given to the Word of God itself. And it's always been interesting to me that this is the longest chapter in the Bible. And it is a chapter that extols the the good book itself. But consider some of these passages that are in Psalm 119 as we contrast that which is true and error. Right? For example, in verse 101, here's what the psalmist says. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Verse 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. In verse 113. I hate vain thoughts, but thy love do I law. I mean, but thy law do I love. It's uh, verse 128. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Verse 163. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Now, the question might be asked, as this particular series continues, does the truth... Make you happy. That's the title of my sermon. Does the truth make you happy? To be happy means to be contented. Do you find contentment in God's truth? And is that enough for you? Is that enough for me? And do we love it? In Matthew 13, Jesus had relayed a story about a man who was seeking for goodly pearls. When he came upon that pearl of great price, that's what he really wanted, wasn't it? And he was seeking for that which was truly the most valuable that he could find. The most valuable. And I want to tell you tonight that there's nothing more valuable to you and to me than knowing truth. Knowing truth. Truth that comes from the God of heaven. You see, our attitude ought to be like that one that is described by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. One who's hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And all of God's commandments, they are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172. But when I want to know what is right, then I have to go to the Word of God. Right? When I want to know what is right, I listen to what God says. And I can know that all of his precepts are right and that they stand in dark contrast, stark contrast, sorry, with that which is in error than that which is wrong. And so it is many have heard us preach about truth and having a love for truth. And yet we fully realize that there are those who do not believe that there is a collective body of information wherein we can find truth. But the Bible is God's word, and that is the truth of God. John 17, 17, Jesus very much laid it out in his prayer to his heavenly Father when he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If God says something, it's going to be true. Right? Right? There is one thing that God cannot do. He cannot lie. He cannot do that. It is impossible for God to lie because God by his very nature is a lover of truth. But we know this, that there are many things out there that run contrary to truth even today. These various isms, and I've spoken to you about these before, are at odds with Truth, relativism, for example, that truth is relative to the situation or subjectivism. That is how I feel about something or how you feel about something. What may be true to me may not be true to you is the kind of attitude that many have. 
That is subjectivism or pluralism, which says there are many different kinds of truth. There are many people today who would say, let's, let's just take what we find acceptable and what might be good and right in all the various religions of the world, and we'll just combine all these together. Have you seen the bumper sticker on the back of some of the cars? And it has all of these symbols. And you know that those symbols are some kind of a religious symbol of some kind. And it says, coexist. Really? Which is true? What is true? What does it mean to understand truth? You see, the person who would defend something like that is a pluralist. A pluralism, the subjectivist, that there's always something called empiric empiricism. That is, it you really can't know truth. And the empiricist says, unless you go into a scientific lab and there you can test it to see if it's truth or not. Or existentialism which says, whatever you experience, that itself is true. I think most people today are, are guilty of pragmatism. And pragmatism just simply says, well, whatever works. <laughs> right? You're not really concerned about truth if it's just whatever works. I will submit to you, to you tonight, and this is where I've always stood that there is a collective body of information that we can know for sure is divine truth. That is the Bible, God's word. All scripture is given by inspiration to God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God, you and me, can be complete. It says perfect there. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 7. That truth will stand. You can mark that one down. That truth will stand. No doubt. And so it's not that the Bible contains truth, but that the Bible is truth. Know this, that truth is not obsolete. In fact, it's absolute, isn't it? All right. And so it is that we take hold of the Bible and we're taking hold of God's divine truth. Now, Josh McDowell, who has done a lot of writing in this area, and he's done some good writing in this area, defending the Bible as the inspired, inerrant word of God, has also conducted a, a study several years, years ago. And the, the study was rather interesting because only... About half of what he called church youth really understood that there was a body of information that can be identified as absolute truth. Now, these were church youth and that they, they attend some religious organization about once a week. And yet they did not realize that there is something called absolute truth. I, I'm thinking, what happened? Where are they getting this information, or where are they not getting this information, you know, the information about truth? They're getting it from the world. The world itself is saying, you, you, there's all kinds of different kinds of truth, and what might be true to you might not be true to me, and, and so on and so forth. Now, that might inform you of where we are today. And might tell you what our future looks like, even in the Lord's church. And that study was done several years ago, and it's probably got, not gotten any better. The Bible has stood the test of time. More important than all other books is the Bible itself, because it proclaims God's truth. And Jesus Stated in the long ago, he said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, my truth shall not 
pass away. Matthew 24, 35. And furthermore, his word, God's word, is truth. Now, in that very marvelous prayer, that beautiful prayer prayed by Jesus, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true, John 17, 17. John 8, 32 informs us that you can know the truth and that truth can set you free, right? You can know it and it can set you free. Those are the words of Jesus. But a lot of people today are rather cynical when it comes to the, this idea of truth. But when you hear somebody today that mocks the idea of absolute truth, know this. There will always be cynics. There will always be skeptics. There will always be. When Jesus stood before Pilate, you might remember that, that Jesus defended truth. But what did Pilate say? Well, what is truth? I'm not sure Pilate really despised Jesus. In fact, I think he would have preferred to set him free because he obviously is a political leader and did not want a whole lot of commotion going on, but is very cynical about truth. When he asked that question, what is truth? How can one really know truth? Now the irony there, maybe the greatest of all ironies, is that the very embodiment of human truth stood right there before him when he asked that question. The one who could rightfully claim that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14 says. And so it is that if we desire to know Jesus, we have a desire and an intense desire to know truth. But here's what we understand about that. And I think everybody or anybody that admits that Jesus is the way to heaven, that he would have to say that's an exclusive way. It's an exclusive way. You remember he said, my way is the way of truth. And so that helps us to understand what our Lord said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, when he says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Because wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads unto destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life. And few there be that find it. Why so narrow? Because truth, by its very nature, is narrow. There's not many roads that lead to heaven, but there is one way, and it's exclusive. It's exclusive. And therefore, Jesus Christ, being the way, is the exclusive way to heaven, and therefore we must know his truth. That's a matter of fact. When we speak of growing as a Christian, all of us should be interested in this new year as we're now in February, but, but we're still needing to understand to grow and develop as a Christian. We do that by taking hold to the word of truth, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, where we desire the sincere milk of the word that for whatever reason that we may what? Grow thereby? Let's get back to our text there. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 6. Love does not rejoice in that which is untrue, not in iniquity, but rejoices in that which is truth. Love does not rejoice in that which is untrue. Now, there, are there people who rejoice in that which is untrue? Uh, yeah. Are there many who would rather know that which is false than know that which is true evidently so that's part of the ungodly system called the world isn't it first john 2 15 through 17 john says there don't love that he says stay in the light where there is truth don't follow after the the, the ways of men where where they are in darkness i mean that's false that's error it leads to eternal destruction don't do that and so when the love of God dwells within us, what does that mean? Well, it means that the Word of God is dwelling within us. The one who is a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of Christian loves truth, all truth, biblical truth, the truth about another. Well, we need to keep that in mind. A 1 Corinthians 13 kind of Christian 
is content with truth and therefore cannot sympathize with that which is evil, that which is untrue. And Paul put it like this in Ephesians 5.11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Reprove them. Why? (laughs) Because it's not after truth, is it? No. So we want to love like Jesus taught us, the love like Jesus loved, to love as the Apostle Paul had instructed us and to be filled with that kind of love. And when we love that way, well, we're going to be very uneasy. Because, uh, you see, whenever you come upon, upon that which we know is not harmony in harmony with divine truth, that biblical love cannot rejoice with iniquity. That's simple enough. And so it is in this context when one is wrongfully spoken against or treated unjustly that you as a Christian, one who has loved dwelling, has loved dwelling within your heart, cannot abide when that injustice is done. That you cannot stand by idly when you see someone not being treated in that proper manner. You see, Jesus didn't do that. He didn't just stand over there to the side and notice those people being treated uh, ill-mannered in any way. It took a lot to stir Jesus, but Jesus always was the master of his emotions. Always. But Jesus did not like it at all to see those who were suffering hurt even more. Or to see people who were helpless be overrun, be defeated by those who were stronger. You know, Jesus really did come to help those who really would not help or cannot help themselves. He was the lover of truth and he was the personification of it. And so the question might be for us tonight, does truth make you happy? Do you rejoice in the truth about somebody else when you hear the the good news about that person? Would you rather hear an evil report or would you rather... Here's something good about another. You know, the reason who's not sure about, the, the person who's not sure about the facts, but still likes to talk, who still likes to run down the others, who does that behind the backs of others. But we identify such an individual as a gossiper, don't we? A gossiper. We have to preach against this. We have to look at ourselves and say, you know, I hope I'm not guilty of that. I hope I'm not guilty of gossiping. Because it's something that our, that our Lord opposes. You see, gossip can be a major sin, not only against God, but really against the others as well. You see, gossip has to do with the telling of, the, of a lie. The half-truth is still a whole lie, isn't it? But so um, among those that God hates, a lying tongue, a false witness that speaketh lies... We need to be careful about that little bird, that little bird that really comes to tell you something. But be very careful, though, because you don't know where that little bird got his or her information. Allow your ear to be the graveyard of gossip. Don't pass it along. Why? Because you are a lover of truth and truth rejoices not in iniquity but rather rejoices in truth right and so it is that there will always be those out there who will make mountains out of molehills and there will I suppose always be those who will hear a particular kind of story then they will twist it with something that it's not and make the situation even worse there are those who will put any situation in the worst possible light instead of trying to put it in the most positive kind of light. And lovers of truth will do just this. They will seek to put any kind of story in its best possible light. Always trying to give another the benefit of the doubt. Now friends, if you rejoice in iniquity and not in truth, What does that mean? Well, it means that you prefer an evil report about somebody else. Now, you have to watch this kind of individual because this kind of person will make up a story if need be. 
It always makes them look better because they think, well, I'm not, at least I'm not like them, you know. Why? Because they love iniquity or that which is untrue more than they love truth. Now, now let's listen to what the Apostle Paul said about this in 1 Timothy 6, verses 4 and 5. 1 Timothy 6, 4 and 5. He says, such an individual, he is proud, knowing nothing, and we've already seen how the heart that loves can't be filled with pride, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Such an individual is empty of truth. Now, how is it that we can detect an evil report? How can, we, how can we detect an evil report? Now, I'll share this with you, and you can take this tonight with you and keep it in mind. How can you detect an evil report? I've already, I've already said to let your ear be the graveyard of gossip and let it die right there. All right? Don't carry it on. Uh, whatever gossip comes your way, if you're not sure about it, then let that be the graveyard. Don't be dwelling on it. And don't pass that along, because why? We are lovers of truth, not in iniquity. And so here comes somebody, and they want to share something with you, you know. Uh, Mom's always told us that if we can't say anything good about somebody, don't say anything at all. And boy, is this good, let me tell you. All right, yeah. Uh, it, it, It used to be when I would attend a lot of lectureships, it would seem to me that the most often quoted phrase among preachers was this. Have you heard? Have you ever heard? Did you hear about preacher so and so? I was like, what? No, I haven't heard that and I don't want to hear it. That's, That's his situation. Maybe we ought to pray for him and his situation. How do you know he hasn't repented? How do you know that he hasn't already made that situation better? And for the love of truth. Don't be telling me anything I don't want to hear. And if you tell me, that's as far as it goes. I'm not telling anybody else. I knew exactly what was about to happen Or at least I learned over time what that was all about. Somebody is really about to get it. Have you heard? Somebody's going to get it. Well, has anybody talked to them? No. Have we? No. You haven't talked to them? So you're just going to take what somebody else says and you're going to go on that? Wait a minute. You see, if you talk to the individual and you got the facts about it, then that would not be nearly as fun, would it? Oh, yeah. You wouldn't really have anything to pass around then. So people love this. But love, though, doesn't. Love rejoices in truth. All truth, not in iniquity. So here are five simple questions that you can ask when somebody comes to you trying to feed you some garbage about somebody else. Number one, what's your reason for telling me this? That's that's what she said. Oh, have you heard? Well, what's your reason for telling me this? All right. Did you know that widening the circle of gossip doesn't make it any better? No, it doesn't. It makes it worse. It only compounds the problem. No, no, that's what's your reason for telling me this? You need to interrupt them. And that should immediately cause that person to be quiet, at least in your presence. Now, most likely, you have to understand this, you might be the next victim. You might be the next victim because you wouldn't listen and you wouldn't put up with that because why? Because you'd be doing what's right. What's your reason for telling me this? Number two, where did you get this information? Where did you get that? So many times they will say, well, I can't tell you. Well, you know, if I tell you... Well, then, well, don't be telling it. You try that one some, sometime when someone says, but people are saying, well, who? Who are, who are saying? Who are, who are these people that are saying this? Well, I don't have to tell. Yes, you do. 
Yes, you do. Because this thing cannot be solved, whatever it may be, until we know the source. Right? But you see, the person who's carrying the evil report are not interested in solving it. They're interested in stirring up a, well, the pot. Right? They're stirring the pot. Number three, here's the question you can ask. Have you gone to those that are those, uh, directly involved? Have you gone to them? Somebody said this, and it's a good quote. Spirituality is not measured by how well we oppose an offender. Spirituality is measured by how effectively we restore an offender. Oh, the, there are those who, behind, who are behind their computer that can mark the offender all day long. I, I, th- I tell you, that's the worst thing about Facebook. Or tweets, Twitter, or whatever you want to call it. It's, it spreads all kinds of information about these people. But the questions need to be asked. You see, the one who's really spiritual is not interested in exposing. He wants to restore. And he wants to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Galatians 6.1. Here's the fourth question. Have you personally checked out all the facts? Have you personally checked out all the facts? Even facts can become distorted when they're not balanced with other facts. And when one does not know the motives behind something. Here's number five. If this doesn't get the carrier of the evil report, nothing else will. Can I quote you? (laughs) Can I quote you if I check this out? Oh, that will probably stop it right there. Oh, no, no, don't say anything. (laughs) It didn't come for me. Right? No, I will quote you as I go and I check this out. Why? Because I'm interested in truth. Love rejoices in truth. All truth and not in iniquity. And so the Lord says, if you are a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of Christian, as you love, as I love, the Lord says, you love truth. It causes you to rejoice. You know, wicked people don't rejoice over truth, my friends. They despise it. They have an intense hatred for it. And I know there's something that the world despises more than those who make that claim. They are those who have a monopoly on truth, right? That's why you might be the next victim, you see. Let somebody go on one of these new programs and they try to defend that which is truth and you'll just see how many will attack that individual. But being on the side of truth, we need to understand will bring persecution. What is truth? Pilate said, Jesus said, I am truth. No one has ever walked the face of the earth, this earth that could make that statement And he was crucified for it. He was put to death on the cross for saying, I am truth. And so it is when we take our stand for truth and we fall in love with it, despising that which is untrue, we too will be persecuted, Matthew 5 and verse 11. But the next verse says, for great is your reward in heaven. Friends, there's always a place when you choose to stand and that is upon God's truth upon his truth. I have said to this to you before that if there is something out there that you can't figure out on your own or if there is something out there that, that the facts seem to indicate this but the truth of the Bible suggests something else, always stay on the right side of truth. Always stay on the right side of truth which is the Bible, right? Yes. If you're not clear on that, you better stay with the truth of the Bible. Everything else will fall into place. The heart that loves is the heart that loves truth. Can we help you even tonight, you know, where did he go? That we need to, un- we need to understand that Jesus has done all that he can to give us hope based upon truth. That's the important thing. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the one who becomes my savior because I'm a sinner in need. And all I have to do is believe that Jesus is the son of God. 
repent of my sins, make that good confession, and be baptized in that watery grave for the remission of our sins. Then to live continually, faithfully, rightfully, by the word of God, till we die. Or until Jesus comes back, if we're still living at that time. That's truth. Are you willing to make that a part of your life? Because love rejoices not in iniquity, but love rejoices in truth. Won't you come as together we stand and sing this song?